why the month of August is set up for chop and volatility in stocks. The key levels that you need to be watching in the S&P, NASDAQ, and crude oil. What if I told you there's a strategy called Dash for Trash that you should be keeping note of? All this today and more with Samantha LaDuke, the founder of LaDukeTrading.com. Samantha has a unique view of the trading world, and she's here today to guide us through some fascinating subjects. From the ins and outs of macro trends, to the complex world of hedge fund factor rotation. Samantha has some interesting insights to share. You're in for a straightforward talk that offers a fresh look at modern trading. Samantha's approach challenges what we think we know and gives us new ways to understand how the market works. So get ready for an enlightening conversation as we explore the ins and outs of the trading world. Traders, today's podcast is sponsored by TradeStation. If you're a serious futures trader, and you want a powerful platform to match your skills? Enjoy flexibility and trading power with TradeStation's award-winning platform. When you open a new futures account at tradestation.com slash Anthony, you get 50% off brokerage fees for the life of your account, plus free market data, special day trading margin rates, and access to over 600 futures products, and TradeStation's powerful trading and analysis platform. So don't wait. Go to tradestation.com slash Anthony to learn more. Samantha, welcome back to the show. Hey, thank you so much. Happy summer. Happy summer. It's great to be with you here on the last day of July. We just closed off the month. Kind of a quiet day, but not a quiet month. What were your thoughts so far on, on the month of July? Um, I've actually been really happy with May, June, and July. So this particular um, rotation thing that I do, this sector rotation, actually ended up being extremely fruitful, which was basically um, stalking value rotation on June 1st. So it has been a continuation through July. And then what I've seen this in the past, it has actually developed into this hedge fund factor rotation, which is a fancy way of saying that the spread between the concentration risk in mega cap tech or the VIP stocks and the shorts that hedge funds are pressing, 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 you know, those oversold plays in everything, what I love to call dash for crash, then starts to reverse and it comes up off the ground. And it gets extremely bid, the Carvanas, the Tilray, the Tupperware, et cetera, and they can last for weeks and weeks and weeks. So you basically have this um, wonderful factor rotation that allows lots of day and swing traders to come in and scoop up these oversold value and dash for trash and junior tech and have a whirlwind of profits for May, June, and July. August, I think it's a lot trickier from here. Much more chop, I'm expecting. So we'll get into that. A dash for trash. I, I love that. That's a great line. But you have a reputation for identifying and trading macro trends. So what are the best macro trades out there right now and how are you trading? So macro, the way that I define macro to micro is using macro mostly as a backdrop. So policies will dictate price, right? Whether the administration is encouraging EV, right? And discouraging fossil fuels, that type of thing is a very strong macro headwind or tailwind. We've obviously had the, the end of the SPR releases, which is a strategic petroleum reserve. So now um, oil has been percolating higher, but it's also been percolating higher since the reflation trades came in on mass from June 1st. So is it inflation or is it the SPR release? And long story short, it, in my opinion, it is absolutely just that momentum of macro that basically supports a directional move and bonds. Awesome, awesome trading in the uh, dollar yen of late, but also just the higher yield regime, the 10 year yield, right? Which is basically keeping bonds at bay from moving higher. So they perpetually get shorted. So bonds are short the rip. Oil just had that strong, you know, oversold relief rally for lack of a better word. I think it's coming into the 83 crude area, which is where it starts to hit its head. And then basically that's it. Dollar, yields, and oil. Those are the primary macro trends that I focus on extensively. Um, to identify basically what sectors are going to be bid up next. I love how you mentioned oil. Oil is actually the market that I've been the most focused on over the last month. Macro backdrop supported by technicals. We both love that when that happens, right? Yep. And you mentioned, I think, a great point. Is it SPR or is it inflation? At what 
point, at what price, I should say, does oil get to where you start to look at that and say, hmm, this now is an inflation theme and maybe this spills over into some, some other things that you're looking at? I actually believe that, but not now. So I kind of look at oil um, in general as let's analyze, all right? So we have a supply deficit. We know that. It doesn't really benefit us to get too excited about oil right now because it, there has been an intervention caller on it, meaning the government wants to make sure that, you know, oil stays, you know, repressed, for lack of a better word, uh, because it drives inflation expectations, right? So um, we also have demand. We had a very strong May, right? That figure was just released. So demand is a little bit stronger in the oil patch. Some people really are focused only on supply demand dynamics. I'm not. I'm just giving you kind of the bullish bent that, yes, demand has been stronger. Wage inflation in large part has helped delay recession. And that nominal higher wage growth has absolutely translated into higher demand consumption, which has basically kept recession at bay. Translation, more oil. But the bigger issue is, in my estimation of speculation within the oil and gas space. But gas is still, even that gas is still snaking around the bottom. It's not really seasonally strong until later, right? Like September, October. And oil, as far as I'm concerned, is just having this temporary inflationary or reflationary trade. But the real tell is speculation of solid oil speculators in the market, and they're not there. So I study kind of like the, the option derivatives market, um, but also the big money speculators that come into an asset class, whether it, it's Bitcoin or, you know, mega cap tech, how much can they actually, you know, keep buying um, the rotation into value or oil. And oil right now to me is um, just this reflationary bounce that will now undergo some chop. I think the big worry of it becoming like that next wave in other words, oil as an inflation hedge, which was a really, really strong, we talked about this last year, right? It was a really strong thesis of mine from November of 2020 until November of 2022. So oil as an inflation hedge, and then it kind of petered out and our, our headline CPI also uh, disinflated, you know, for lack of a better word. We, we basically had 9.1% last June, and we just cracked into the four handle this June. So we've had what's called a deceleration of inflation on the headline, but we still are in an inflationary regime. There is no part of me that sees deflation anywhere, but oil is a special case, right? We constantly look at supply and demand, but that's not enough. Oil speculators are very important. Inflation as a hedge is very important. And then, as you just mentioned, you know, kind of combining the macro with the technical, they're not going to. They, meaning uh, the administration, especially before an election year, will really work hard to keep the, um, the, you know, the oil animal spirits at bay. So I think it makes it tougher. So we have to get over some key, key levels, right, to really have conviction that this is going to take off like it did in October of 2021. October 2021, it literally doubled between October and March, right, March 8th. 2022. Um, so, uh, did I did that right? Yes, yes, yes. So <laughs> it was, um, no, yes, yes, yes. That's six months. Remember, it went from 65 to 130? Yeah. Rude. I don't All remember right. the exact dates, but I do remember the prices. Okay. So it literally was um, October 2021 into that March 2022, March 8th to be specific, because I had a price target of 130 and it hit exactly. And then it started to, you know, soften rollover. And we have been in a solid sideways chop, big picture in um, oil price. You know, specifically, I, I use crude a lot, WTIC. But this is where I think we're at. We're, we're just hitting our head up against resistance again soon, which is 83. And it, that's also the figure, if you remember, when OPEC did its surprise cut, surprise, um, OPEC plus, it, it actually popped up to 83 and then completely rolled back over and went right down and through 65. WTIC, right? Down to 62. So th the point is, there's a lot of shake and shimmy in this channel. I think it's just tradable in a channel. But as a macro thesis of we're going to have inflationary wave because oil is going to get out of control. You really think they're going to let that happen before election? I have my I have my I have my doubt. 
couple of things I want to stay in oil just for a couple of quick questions here. Number one, besides using oil futures or oil options, do you ever look at maybe trading the electric companies like Rivian, and Tesla? But if you think oil is going to go up, I'm wondering if you ever just look at those types of things as uh, opportunities as well. Not as a, as a proxy for oil, no. So what I really, really like is um, yields and oil. Basically, yields without QE, I'm talking about the 10-year yield in particular, without QE follows commodities. They, they absolutely track very well together. With QE, you can see they're completely inverse. So that's when I could kind of see that there's some funky stuff going on, you know, with like dollar swaps and the like with Bank of Japan. Remember a few weeks ago, we had a massive U.S. dollar drop. And it actually was a three sigma move over five or six days. We had a very large drop in the dollar yen and dollar. So this also helped, by the way, the reflation trades and um, and oil. But for me, it's not a good proxy to use EV. EV has its own kind of ecosystem, um, but definitely the oil and gas plays, right? So th there are ETFs for the oil and gas companies. There are the actual proxies. And some of them trade beautifully with the underlying uh, some, of course, you know, like crack spreads, um, tracking that bullish move of late with ULSD, which has been also rising up since that June 1st. Uh, long story short, those are fabulous for refiners. So I like to trade the actual options on equities, whether it be the individual stocks or the ETFs versus some of the more, you know, like, like you said, not as tightly correlated proxies like EV. I think EV is very much driven by right now the, the China stimulus. So, so many of the e Toyota and China stimulus. So the EV plays actually, this uh, Toyota was a recommendation also on June because it was a value a play. And I literally was like stalking all of the stuff that was extremely oversold, too much so. And then it came out with their EV production numbers and quite tire. It went from like 85 to 160. It was, it was an amazing, amazing, very short duration trade of like three weeks. Those numbers also helped give confidence to the EV sector. So the NEOs, the XPEV, the Rivian, LI. And by the way, you probably notice I'm a sector rotation uh, specialist. So when I see that there's going to be a macro backdrop that's going to support or a fundamental one, like the Toyota earning uh, release of, of their EV production, then I know that that sector is going to get supported. Then, since so many of them are China plays, there has to be an undercurrent of Chinese stimulus to get them up off the ground. And then there has to be short covering because they have been pummeled to beautiful profits for hedge funds in this constant, you know, again, trade VIP, U.S. mega cap tech long and short Chinese ADRs and, and you know, EVs and all that hype. So the point is, when that started to rotate, both on the value rotation, also on this, you know, short covering rotation, it also got wind at its back from, you know, press release after press release of Chinese stimulus. So they are really helping that whole um, sector of, uh, of K-Web and, and BABA as well, the internet play. But, but EV was the first to kind of start that march higher. I'm glad I got you to talk about that. That was a great explanation of that. I, I want to go back to the bonds because you talked about that. And before we get on today, you know, it's the end of the month as well. I was taking a look at the CME FedWatch tool. And if you go back, Samantha, what, maybe three, four months ago, all these rate cuts were being priced in at the end of the year. That has completely changed. And now I was looking at the CME FedWatch tool and it looks like we're going to stay put until May of next year as the next yeah. time shows that we're going to see a 25 basis point cut. Thoughts on that? This is tough because honestly, this to me was uh, going to start to peter out, long story short, on March 12th. So I put out that tweet basically that, okay, they're going to, White House, Treasury, Fed, they've all come in and they're going to backstop banks. It really was a bailout. So of sorts, but they did it creatively, you know, with some particular facilities and then basically promising yeah. everyone, you know, everyone. Deposit, you get a car, you get a car, everyone's going to get a car. So basically, everyone's fine. We're going to make sure that there's unrealized losses. You know, you can, you can make them back at par, not just ignore all this drama. So basically, the market got this loose monetary policy stimulus and it went higher, right? 
So that was a, that was a beautiful kind of impulse move. And then that was my trigger that they're going to step down and pause come June. So they're done because I don't want to create any other friction also in the banking sector, right? So we did come through. They actually paused for a month and, and basically they, you know, they, they said, uh, we can always do it again. Um, but I really, this to me is cooked. In other words, they were behind the curve. They're, they're, they're trying to play catch up. They're realizing now that they are way late to coming in because wage inflation is such a lagging indicator, but it's also a ginormous sticky component of inflation and also why the economy is also kind of sticking together um, because this wage inflation backdrop is helping with companies pass on higher prices with higher prices and houses to stay bid. And so the, the long and the short of it is I don't expect them to get aggressively into rate hikes until they start to lose that whole, what do you call it, argument, right? Which is inflation mandate of coming back down to 2% bull. They're going to move that goal post up to 3%. And he even said, Powell said on his last, you know, podium presentation that it, it, they don't even see coming that their inflation mandate of 2% getting hit until 2025. In the meantime, in the between time, the bigger worry that will pull recession risk forward is a wage inflation spiral. So as more and more companies have to meet the, uh, the demands of higher wages and pass those costs on at a point that will just start to choke, right? So they, they're going to be hiking into higher inflation. That's an exercise in, in for, you know, a credit crisis, but that's probably not for a year out. So I don't believe the, they're going to cut in May um, mandate. There's going to be too much inflation. And the only reason why they would cut is because of risk of recession. And we've delayed recession with, with higher uh, wages, again, feeding nominally into more demand and consumption. So I, I think the bond market is absolutely trapped. I think Fed is trapped. And that's why I continue to say that bonds are a fabulous short, short the rip, short the rip. Yields are absolutely bid. We're going to have a higher rate regime. That means bonds are going lower. Now I know there's a seasonality of trading TLT and ZB and ZN and all that. This, you know, end of the year kind of seasonality. Everything has a season, right? Um, VIX makes its low typically in July and bonds as well. But Relatively speaking, the risk reward is to the downside in bonds. So I am absolutely still very bullish on inflation, very bullish on yields. I have been since summer of 2020 and nothing has changed. So that does mean I will be bullish again oil, but I haven't seen the speculators come into the space and really, really get excited about that space. You know, we don't know what the election outcome will be. But we will start to see oil behave a little bit different as we get closer to it, because one of the ways that the administration can keep inflation expectations lower is to suppress the price of oil. If we get a Republican backdrop, oil will start to get, the speculators will start to get enthusiastic about it again. And that will also kind of coincide with the supply crunch and, and such. But that's, that's next year's problem. And I'm not politically inclined at all. I'm just saying that's one of the triggers that I'm looking for, for speculation to come back into the oil market. And uh, right now, I think this is just an inflationary impulse in oil price and in and yields are definitely, definitely more sturdy and strong. That that I'm very bullish about. When you say you're looking at speculators, are you looking at COT data? Yep. And all, but all aspects of it. I'm very actually blessed that we have, I have a team of contributors, right? But it's not just me. I actually have free products, and in total, 10 contributors, and one of them is just an oil trader. And his father was an oil trader before him. So he prepares this deep analysis because his clients primarily are those who are buying it, the physical. So I don't have to be an expert. I can say, Robert, <laughs> you know, what, what's this look like? And he's like, it hasn't changed. So that's what I mean by it hasn't come in. Now, I can look at option, the derivatives market as it relates to equities, options on equities and index and, and the right. And so I can see when we're going to get much more sector rotation in the energy space 
but he's looking at the purely physical. So that's, that's, I'm relying on him for that intel. In the same way that I'm relying on Craig, who runs our Macro Advisor Edge product, to let me know how was this, you know, UST issuance that came out today, which is a quarterly. It was a lot more than expected. So those are, that's their wheelhouse, right? My, yeah. my focus is very much on kind of serving the intermediate market, got a beginner community, the Discord product. I definitely have the more, you know, advanced macro edge product, but my stuff is very much tradable sectors, tradable stocks, using options primarily on, on equities and using that macro as a backdrop. So that's basically how I approach my analysis. Oh, I love that about you. And we're definitely going to get into that. I want to go to the stock market again. It's been on, on a tear in the recent months. We all know this, right? I mean, the market just keeps going up, uh, even though the Fed continue to raise rates. And Samantha, I was told stock market can't go up when rates are going up. I, I believe we were all kind of told that it didn't end up working out that way. But how could we have predicted this rally? Two ways. Very, very important. Liquidity. I'm a huge liquidity follower, and that's not just um, the derivatives market, by the way, which is a lot of options, which we'll talk about why the market has continued to grind higher and higher and higher, which is uh, very much market makers and gamma and delta hedging and the rest. But the bigger, bigger, bigger elephant in the room was back in October of September, October of 2022. You can look on your chart. You can clearly see that was the equity bottom. So I didn't know that was going to be, you know, the bottom for this particular impulse, nor did I know it was going to get this strong. But we were live trading on literally Friday morning, October 21st. The uh, Bank of Japan had already done one massive yen intervention back in September, September 22nd specifically, which, by the way, I believe, and a colleague, um, that that was the trigger for the guilt blowout. Very, very strong thesis on that. But anyway, fast forward to, to October 22. This was their second major yen intervention at the time that USD JPY was at 152, which happened to be a price target because it was yearly resistance. So what did that mean? It meant that they were flooding in to protect, right, their, their, their bonds. And they were just also helped by the Fed and Treasury. Treasury is like, oh, yeah, we have a little liquidity issue. Yellen came out and talked about that. And Fed is like, yeah, you know what? We're thinking about pausing. And uh, Swiss National Bank got, you know, multi-billion dollar dollar swaps with uh, the Fed. And China started doing stimulus the week after this whole transition uh, started to really put a bottom in things. Uh, bonds stopped going down. Gold started flying higher, you know, with NASDAQ. And basically the whole the, you know, what do you call it? Instead of the, the, the Titanic hitting an iceberg, it actually slowly moved and then got supported. It later came out after we, I was tracking this, after I was tracking this, and I mean every single day, I, I'm like, look the global liquidity that's coming in. We're not just, it's global central bank liquidity infusion. Matt King of Citibank said after a 10% rise, he came, he came in and he's not on Twitter and he doesn't talk very much. He's like, we just had a $1.5 trillion global central bank liquidity infusion. And I'm like, that's it. That is, that is absolutely what happened. I couldn't track that liquidity, right? I don't have those tools. So that is what, and he said, it's not fundamental. But then we came into the January effect. And January effect was this really oversold, right? Fang stock extravaganza, which got bid up. And then it just continued. Uh, petered out in February, February 2nd. Then it rolled over on February 16th. Um, I've got indicators for all this stuff. So I could, I could tell, you know, when selling starts to come in, because again, liquidity for me is important. I can't track it globally as well as some others, but I can track it in the market day to day. So I could see that they were selling. It was a sold to you. Didn't know it was going to be a bank crisis. Then we had the bank crisis. And then Fed, Treasury, again, came in Sunday evening at seven o'clock, six o'clock, right before futures, right? and said, we got this, we got your back, don't worry about it. Um, so that was literally March, and guess what? We bottomed and we've been moving higher ever since. And that actually created a mega cap concentration risk rally, which means nothing else really got excited. Really, nothing else got excited until May. It was totally focused on this exuberance in thing, right? I mean, mega cap tech. Um, NVIDIA was also AI that, that hit in April. But more to the point, that concentration risk was at the expense of everything else, right? 
value, daft for trash, Chinese, it didn't matter what sector, they were all deplorably on the ground. And small caps relative to SPY, I'm an intermarket analyst, so I, I track a lot of ratios of cross assets, was at its lowest since 2008. Transports relative to SPY were also at 2008 levels. That's extremely oversold. What happened after that? What happened with transports? You, you've seen what happened with shipping, trucking, um, airlines. All right. So we, we had that rotation, but it didn't trigger until June. They had to kind of stop buying the FANG stock. They had to like, like peter out. In other words, the funds that were buying Apple and NVIDIA and Microsoft and, and the like, oh my, because it was safe. It wasn't risk on. It was risk aversion. They weren't buying anything else. They wanted what was safe, right? Those are the best bond proxies, long duration, you know, cash thick companies on the planet. They went in with en masse and bid that stuff up. And it wasn't until literally that kind of like got satiated that they, this, this rotation that I stalk, um, pre-market literally on June 1st, which it was into value, really started picking up. And June, um, we had lots of nice junior tech also come up off the ground in May. June then started the value rotation. Daft for trash, meaning heavily short stuff, really started picking up at the end of, of June, but definitely July. Now that's now a time for a pause because closing on that little rant to kind of show you, yes, you can tell because you can track where money's going intraday and Globally, it's time. It's time for a pause. August is usually shop fest, and this sector rotation usually ends in volatility. So we do have an opportunity for some volatility to come in here um, in earnest, I think, coming up in August. Well, let's stay there. What do you expect coming into August, CHOP, as you mentioned? Vo no, volatility, like CHOP and volatility. We had a little tease of it, um, you know, last week. I, I actually, I put on, on a, uh, um, to clients, I'm I literally about 1030 in the afternoon. I'm like, this is too perfect. Something's wrong. <laughs> and I don't know if you follow that, but that's trader instinct right there. That has nothing to do with uh, what did I put with the tweet? I said, these are skills that are acquired, not learned. So when everything's working, that's exactly when you take enormous care. And then we had a surprise announcement by the Bank of Japan that they were considering expanding, tweaking their yield curve control. And it, it caused VIX to spike very strongly intraday on that Thursday. The next day, they did, in fact, widen their yield curve to basically a, a cap of 1% from 0.5. And they had just expanded it in December from 0.25 to 0.5. So long story short, they, they kind of sent it up the flagpole. The market reacted violently. And then they came in and said, but we'll be flexible. Don't worry. <laughs> so that was the precursor for some volatility. That's what I mean. I think we're not done with that type of uh, shake and bake for August. And I think we could get some sizable volatility for, um, for August into September. And that will reprice equities. And then they can get bought again. Think about it. I mean, we're priced for perfection. It's time to, you know, take some chips off the table. Let it digest, let it reprice, and then go back in later when it's cheaper. I'm curious what you think about a blow off top. There's a lot of people talking about that, projecting as this is how we'll all end. We're going to have a blow off top at some mm -hmm. point, whether it's the end of this year and early next year. Curious what your thoughts are on that. I thought if we got above 4,400 that we would, I actually said this in a webinar a while back. Obviously, we hadn't gotten to 4,400 yet, but I actually thought if we got above 4,400, we would have the potential for a melt up. We haven't had it. it. It's been grinding higher steadily. It's solid. The options market still has control of the price. And especially in the summer, it's a lot thinner, right? Volumes are thinner. So they can sell those puts and uh, sell those calls. And that just kind of forces dealers um, and, and buying the underlying. And we are just basically right now at a point where we're churning sideways and we're going to have a big move because of the structure of the options market. We could absolutely have a spike higher um, or we could just roll over very strongly. My focus is on the gamma levels. So gamma just means that when we trigger volatility, there are these price insensitive sellers, they're called quants. 
and CTAs and the like. And they basically will be um, buying at certain levels and selling at certain levels. And those are the ones that I track extremely closely because, for example, if we have a pull down, and I said this actually uh, when we had that market shimmy on Thursday because of the Bank of Japan release, when we had that, that shimmy, I said, all we need is to break a negative 0.6% in SPY and volatility had already come up, but we'll get even busier, right? So this is 0.6%. And if we have a negative 2.5% in one day on the SPY, that will also trigger even more volatility. We got 0.64% and the market bounced viciously. <laughs> so they, they know their levels. I know what their levels are. So, so that's why trading, um, if you know the volatility triggers for gamma, it's extremely productive for futures traders, but, you know, also um, swing traders that are trying to, you know, use options on equities and stay in a particular direction. And they don't want any, you know, disruption because volatility reprices those, those options dramatically and profits evaporate. Um, so this is definitely something um, that we could still have. But I'm going to tell you my levels and, and clients know this because I've been waiting. At, if, if we hit a level, then I give the next level. We hit that level. It's still bullish. I don't see anything yet for rollover. Now we're starting to soften. This is true. But the next level I have is 4660. That is SPX. And that equates to um, about 390 in the Qs. And for NASDAQ composite, it's about 14,600. All right. So those have been the price targets for the the what I call the completion of this rally. When we hit those levels, I believe strongly the market will roll over. So will it be above that and I'm wrong? That's the level to trade against. But I think more, more likely, given everything about, I've, I've talked about the staff for trash that leads to volatility, July makes it seasonal low, um, bonds for the most part do as well. I think we're gonna have some volatility that actually comes in um, whether we hit those levels or not, but those are my specific level. And then if we get above 14,600, 14,600, right in NASDAQ, 390 in the Qs, uh, 4,660 in SPX, yes, we can absolutely have a melt up, but that'd be dangerous. And I don't have strong, you know, bet that we're going to have that. I think more likely it will tag and roll over. But why is it dangerous to have a melt up? Well, because that's the hardest pattern to trade, right? When we have a when we have a melt up, it creates a parabola. And everyone's looking for a parabola if they're long, but not if you're trapped long. Because if you've ever traded low float, low priced stocks, which have been basically popping up like daisies, right? The Carvana is the, is, is 27. But I mean, what, it started. But like Tupperware or it, it doesn't matter. It starts out. It's very inexpensive. It's 80 cents. It goes to 350. When do you sell, right? The volatility enters a parabola. That's not even a good example because it's the bottom fishing, but a, a parabola basically means you're going to have trapped long and they start to get very nervous and they start to do some profit taking and then they start to do a little bit more. So it introduces volatility to parabolas and then they start selling on mass because they get wicked nervous and that creates a liquidity event that then does that kind of Eiffel Tower, right? That'd yeah. be terrible for our market. We don't want melt up. We don't want a 2000. We don't nah. <laughs> yeah. So I would much rather gently tag those levels, roll over, get prices that are cheaper, and then go back in and, and, and get some good discounted stocks. That's, that's my, you know, my wish. I don't know if we'll get it, but that's what I'm looking for. Let's talk about your process a little bit. We've talked about macro to micro, and you've said to me your process of analysis is not simple, but your clients want the simple trade off trade setup. You've been giving us the simple trade setups with your levels. Explain how you do that. I use inter intermarket analysis, which most people don't really follow or know about, but it's my secret sauce. So intermarket analysis for me is I spot inflection points. I'm using um, cross asset uh, comparisons, a lot of ratio analysis. I'm using divergences. They help me predict if a particular ratio is extremely overbought or oversold, like I just gave you those examples, right, with um, small caps and transports relative to SPY at 2008 lows, that they were due a reflexive bounce and look what's happened since June 1st. That's intermarket analysis and it's fine. It. That's not macro. That's intermarket analysis. It is time for a 
reversal, period. And so that helps me predict some of these macro moves and size up also the breadth or the intensity and the duration of the move. So macro is a great backdrop. Fundamental is also very helpful as a tool, a toolbox. Um, and a technical analysis is absolutely critical at, at knowing when to get in, when to get out, right, for both stops and profit targets. But it's really, really the intermarket that makes my analysis really shine. So that's what I mean by it's complicated in that many people don't follow it. They're much more up to date on macro, um, you know, asset classes that they follow um, or newer traders. They're only technical, but that's typical until they get more knowledge, right? Some are just siloed fundamental analysts, right? They only care about, you know, profitability and, and growth rates and, you know, EPS and all of that. So that obviously has kind of gone with the days of Peter Lynch in large part. Value managers did not have such a successful run when we had 13 years of NASDAQ outperformance until the rollover in January 22, right? So fundamentals as a key siloed analysis is not my core. Macro, not my core. I use intermarket with fundamental and macro and then technical to get in and out. But I would be completely lost if I didn't follow the derivatives market. The derivatives market for me, that option market, that structure of how to identify when the money is moving in and moving out is absolutely key uh, to knowing how long to stay in that trade. So this is extremely helpful to know basically these gamma levels, like I told you, right? Or basically just that whole concept of dispersion. And it doesn't matter. The point is, for those who are into option trading, it is very important if you know you're a swing trader to have a very solid and steady positioning in that instrument. Um, I'm not talking about just unusual option activity because you want to trade it, you know, intraday. I'm talking about more durable trends. So that's what I look for, more durable trends, and then pull back on the time frame and swing trade it. And then, of course, you can always have those lovely chases intraday and for a few days. But for the most part, um, I'm really looking for the bigger fish. What would you say is the most significant error you see people make when they execute a macro to micro trade? Um, just being married to a particular view because it's how it's worked in the past. And that obviously, that's tough because it has worked for 40 years, risk parity. It died with COVID. That's, uh, that's been my baseline bet. Literally, bonds stopped going up in August of 2020 and risk parity, it, it just, it's, it's gone. So there are reasons for that, that I get lots of people who push back. You're saying basically that U.S. Treasuries are no longer a safe collateral, if that's my argument. So they go to a macro mindset, and I'm saying, I can see a 40-year channel that has aptly broken down in bonds, and specifically, I'm going to stick with a 10-year just because it's our biggest and most liquid, um, you know, one. And basically, we're going higher in yields. And the only way we're going to have that, uh, you know, drama in price, in, in Fed cuts, is if we pull forward recession. And how are we going to pull forward recession if wage inflation is so dang entrenched? And it is entrenched. So we're going to have to have something as a catalyst to really upend the higher yield call. So for me, I've been right. And I, I will, if we break down and stay below 3.33 on a 10 year, and I mean stay below it, then absolutely we can start to, you know, weaken and, and soften and, and move lower. But for right now, we've got the exact opposite. We are extremely well supported above that le level for many, many, many months now. So I'm, I'm very bullish on yields. And that means um, I think the macro argument of bonds are going to recover um, is, is unfortunately old thinking. Let's talk about risk management. What is your risk management strategy when it comes to trading macro to micro? I mean, how do you manage risk on the micro scale? while still taking advantage of the opportunities that you've recognized on the macros? Two ways. One, don't risk more than you're willing to lose. I uh, say that as a mantra in life, but also in trading. And two, I really like option structure because it defines the risk. So um, I, I do you do event risk trading? I'm just kind of like where, where it's kind of binary, zero or one, or do you use futures? Like what is your tool 
when when you're trading most often to manage your risk? For me, I, I do both. I mostly am doing futures, but like on days like today, it's the end of the month. I'll use do some binary outcome type stuff with, you know, intraday, you know, zero TTE options and stuff like that. Just depends on, you know, scenario like Fed days. A lot of times I like to, I mean, this recent Fed, I was actually short NASDAQ into it, but this is not your typical Fed day for me. But um, most of the time it's futures or zero DTEs is, is what I do the most, even if I really, start. okay. Yeah. So I know I do none of those zero DTEs. I recommend them, you know, for clients. I'll set up a trade and, you know, for Friday, for example, we had Roku, which was like outsized and I know they want to chase that stuff. Um, so I'll set it up for client, but I can't do what I do. And also that zero DT, that's just, that's just crazy adrenaline. But, um, what I, what I like to do is this sector rotation, right? So uh, per personally, I love, don't hold it against me. Boring is profitable. So from, and I, I love and look for momentum, which is the strongest performing stocks in a, in a, in a particular sector and then basket trading that sector. So value rotation, pre-market on June 1st, I'm like, I'm crazy about IPI, who cares about Intrepid, right? Art of agriculture, VNO, Veronado, and Caterpillar. And I gave a few other names. I think they're absolutely going to explode. All of them did great, for example, but nobody was looking at them, right? So those are the kind of plays that I like or for trend plays that are very strong, multi-month kind of continuation plays. I like very solid breakout. And then because my trend portfolio is long only, swing can be long and short. And chase, for me, it's not going to be a zero DTE. It's going to be a few days. So I'll use typically next week's option. And if it's really directional and it's really moving, there's tons of, of volume coming into it. But then it's not done. I don't think it's done. I think if it's got that much enthusiasm, it should digest and then continue higher. So I use technical analysis and then I recommend, honestly, spreads. Um, because again, I'm, I'm kind of running a live trading room and have lots of analysis that I'm posting. The intermarket, the macro, the quant, a little bit of fundamental, tons and tons of of you know, technical analysis on sector rotation and individual stocks. So oftentimes the clients will just say, yeah, I like that one. And they'll, they'll go pick their own time frame, right? Do, is this for them a chase, a swing or a trend? Do they want to use stock or options? Do they want to use a spread or directional? And then how to protect it if earnings are coming into play, right? So I have actually a custom trade support channel where they can come and ask their questions. And I have my live trading room moders, moderators help them fashion a trade with defined risk so that they could actually, you know, stay with that. Um, so that's kind of my go-to is going to be uh, defined risk options and then helping clients depending on where they are in their, you know, in their risk profile. Yeah. I should just clarify too, for me, that's how I day trade, which is my smallest account, but I'm with you. Oh, okay. And there, I am not, my body, Samantha could not handle that all the time. And I'm 20 something years into this. It's like, there's no way. I mean, I'm, I'm doing these on a case by case basis. Like recently when I was long oil, I had a small futures position and I was only intraday. I wasn't even holding it overnight and I was using some options so I could try to participate. And I even bought some, some oil stocks. And so that's why even I asked you about uh, the EVs because I actually went and bought Rivian and I went and bought some Tesla because I was like, you know what? I think oil is going to spike here. It might give a boost to these stocks. And I was just picking your brain on them. But so for oh, me, okay. I kind of if I'm day trading a, a scenario or an event or something I like, I, those are the I use futures and zero TTs. But that is not something okay. I every day. Like I said, I can't. I don't want to be fully grace, man. I'm trying to, I'm holding on to everything I got with this color that I've got left. So what's, what's the expression? There are bold traders. There are old traders, but there are no old, bold traders. Something yes. like, <laughs> I don't consider myself old by any stretch. And I know I'm bold, but my point is this is for you where you can play with some discretionary and get the adrenaline, but you know how to manage it, right? You have to stay focused on it. There's, there's no chance I could do that during the day. There's just too much going on. But I absolutely um, look for the risk that's coming into the market and warn clients that you need to de defend and protect. Like the good, t it's, 
the good times are going to get tested. So I like that focus on risk as the backdrop for the market and then put those hedges on when we're starting to get into a potentially volatile place. You can still keep your, you know, your longs, for example, but do it smartly. We've got no edge for earnings. Why? If you're trading Airbnb, which was a strong recommendation of mine, into earnings, and I said very, very specifically, by the way, they report this week, maybe a smidgen left, like a few that you don't care if you're wrong, but I don't have any edge with earnings. So I love to trade into earnings or after earnings. That's another way that I define risk. Some people love to sell options, right? So that they can collect that premium with an IV crush, speaking of options, right? On an earnings event. Um, in other cases, they have some kind of belief or edge that it's going to have an outsized move. Do I know what Apple's going to do on Thursday night? No. Do I think that we're absolutely priced to perfection and this could be it? Like we just, we're, we're going to hit it and then we're going to start to roll over because all that sold to you underneath you know, it was finally like manifest. We, was like, we, we, we got through Apple. Now let's go take the rest of August off. Okay, we'll come back in September and hit it again. Seriously. So, you know, I, I'm not really one who is um, also recommending um, earnings plays during um, you know, for earnings, unless we're already into it. And then I'm much more on the side of you want to hold on. You, you, you got to defend and protect or Take it off and you can get back in after. So if you could make only one trade for the rest of the year, which market would you pick and how would you approach that trade to minimize your risk and maximize your profit? Well, I, again, love the idea of the value rotation. And here's why. And not because I'm boring, you know, with that set up. When this is um, done, this growth concentration risk, okay, that we, and I call it, I, I call it, call it risk aversion where they started to pile in to the large cap tech plays, okay? Um, AI helped it, right? The, the Mark bailout helped it. The AI extravaganza helped it. Um, and then, of course, we started to kind of peter out and go sideways since the value rotation and dash for trash and all that jazz. But the bigger issue is I really think that that's a beautiful backdrop for growth to really underperform the, set, the, the latter part of the year. So... Again, I'm expecting volatility, reprice, lots of things. The narrative is going to get all freaked out again. And that's when it probably gets supported. We could go down all the way down to that kind of like 4,000 and tag that again. Like that, that's not out of reason in the next few months. But I think that that's going to be um, a case where the outperformers like NVIDIA, oh my God, it's so priced, overpriced, will have the most to fall. I'm talking about the the large cap and the small caps will fall less and they will actually be bid up on this reflation theme. So I do like um, that uh, end of year concentration in more of the oversold stuff than in the overbought stuff. Let's just put it that way. I think that I think mega cap's going to roll over and we're going to get a nice kind of continuation in some of these value plays. Traders, a quick pause in programming to show you something on the TradeStation platform. I'm loving my conversation today with Samantha. One of the key takeaways that I'm getting from today's conversation is choosing the right vehicle for every trade idea. She talks about macro to micro. She talks about using derivatives and watching options flow. What's so important as a day trader is choosing the right market to trade for your macro trade idea. I know that sounds so easy. If I like the price of crude oil, do I just go in and buy crude oil futures? Well, you may want to trade crude oil options on futures. You may want to trade a oil stock. You might want to trade the EV market that I talked about today pertaining to the price of crude oil. That is entirely up to you. You might have a macro idea that you want to take to a day trade or a swing trade, but you have to choose the right vehicle and you need to have a platform that allows you to trade all of these markets under one roof. And that's the main reason why I love TradeStation so much because I can trade crude oil right here. I can trade Rivian. I can trade Tesla. I can trade E-mini S&P, of course. I can trade micros, options on futures. And that's so important because if you are looking to become a professional trader, you need a robust platform like TradeStation in order to be able to execute all of the different contracts that you like. Back to the programming now with Samantha. Well, as usual, you are so much fun to talk to. I love your... <laughs> 
Energy is great. I got to tell you, every time I'm getting set to talk to you, I love it. It's a fun conversation. Your energy is great. Your confidence um, and just the way you explain things is just, it's awesome. And it's always so much fun to speak with you. Oh, well, thank you. Explain to everybody what it is that you guys do at Leduc Trading and what makes you guys special compared to, there's so much competition out there, Samantha. What makes you guys special? You know, it's just, honestly, I have a read of the market and my read is not siloed, right? So my, in, my, my process might be a little uh, non-consensus, right? With this kind of, uh, blend of so many contributing factors. But that also means that I'm much more flexible, that I don't get married to a stock or to a, a thesis. I'm very, very open to both the bull and the bear case, and I'm lawyering that trade all the time. So the clients know that I'm very much working hard to figure out the direction, the intensity, the duration of that move from an index or sector or stock standpoint. We've got tons of supporting contributors that also weigh in with their analysis and their trade setups and also that trade support. That's unique. Who else provides trade support? Like you want to protect your position into earnings. Let's, let's take a look at some advanced option tactics, blah, blah, blah. So this is really not um, usual and customary. So I think that that is one place where we meet traders wherever they are on their journey. The other is that I have three products. I have a kind of a beginner, intermediate, and advanced. I'm very, very focused on the core product, which is our club offering, right? So I run the live trading room, um, but I also have a great, fabulous product for beginners and momentum traders, the ones that love those zero DTE, but they need to do it safely. And they have this community of mentors that really share education, plus their analysis, plus their trade setups, and there's encouragement. I've been doing this for a while. You've been doing this for a while. I don't need anybody to encourage me. Like, I, I mean, I know what I'm looking for. I'm either going to be right or wrong. Next, I don't, I, don't, I don't need any drama. I don't want any drama. So it, it, a, a younger group needs this community. So hence, that's the beginner product. And it's fabulous for momentum trading. So I am, my, my bread and butter is absolutely swing trading, right? So I'm really, really looking for when volatility enters. But also in the meantime, all those sector rotations and, and how to trade them. Um, and that's where I help clients make a lot of money or, and lose less. And then the advanced product is very much run by Craig, like I said, the macro edge manager, who is very focused on more fixed income. Also, um, positioning as it relates to mostly ETF because it's money managers that are, you know, literally dealing with, you know, this, all the stuff that portfolio managers have to deal with. So he's concierge to them. And they trust me for my market direction uh, calls. And uh, again, but all three of the products provide an enormous amount of uh, custom engagement, all three. So it just really is meeting a trader where they are in their journey. So I don't care if I'm the same or different from anybody else. I'm doing it exactly how I want to. I'm delivering this analysis. I love this. I mean, this is obviously my passion. Passion for markets, passion for helping clients, and passion for my process that might not fit nice and tidy into somebody else's, but it works great. So um, that's it. It's 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 definitely um, LeDukeTrading.com. It's it's analysis, education, and trades. And we've got them a, a new website coming out in September. Very excited that we'll highlight those contributors um, and some new products, some fintech products I've been working on behind the scenes. So it you know it just. It's an evolution, but um, they can also find me on Twitter, obviously. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm mostly doing this gig um, for clients in the live trading room. And we have a Slack client workspace where I put all of my analysis. And sometimes it can get really detailed. Like I can write a lot about how wage inflation has delayed recession and, you know, looking for, you know, precise jobless claims numbers and the SOM rule. And I could get into, you know, I can get into the granularity of um, when I'm going to be very, very worried that oil as an inflation hedge is actually going to spike yields dramatically higher. I'm not there yet. So that's what I mean. But I'm, I'm looking at the macro all the time. But um, for the most part, it is very focused on actual trade setups based on my sector rotation analysis and um, option trading specifically. I love it. So it's Leduc Trading. And what is the Twitter handle? Or is it the X handle? What do we say now? No, I no, I 
uh, seriously, how to ruin a brand. Yeah, it's, it's at Samantha LaDuke. Uh, we also have an at LaDuke Trading um, Company one. Uh, I do more of the macro. The at LaDuke Trading is kind of more of the micro. Um, but I also, also have a YouTube channel. And that YouTube channel is getting also um, uh, filled up, meaning uh, Craig and I do uh, um, a macro to micro power hour. Uh, Rithika and Riley, uh, you know, they're posting their weekly um, trade setups. Um, I've got myself doing a, a market timing call every day. So that kind of gives a view of what I'm still seeing. Like I saw the the Chinese ADRs a few weeks ago starting to get accumulated in options. So I started looking for that stimulus and they've been doing great. The EVs, you know, so I'm looking for sectors and then I'll pick a stock or two or three within that and set that up. Um, and then that will luckily like a five minute segment will get posted on YouTube. Um, but it's out of like a two or three hour live trading room. So you're not getting everything. <laughs> but the YouTube definitely has some great education um, and trades that you can uh, take for free. Everybody definitely go and check out what Samantha and her team has going. Samantha, you're an amazing person. You're a great trader and you're a fantastic leader. Thank you so much for joining me today at Patriot Radio Show. I am honored to be here. Thank you so much, Anthony. Have a great rest of the summer. So remember... If you want to learn more about TradeStation and get 50% off your brokerage fees, go to TradeStation.com slash Anthony. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a five-star review on iTunes. Never miss an episode. Go to AnthonyCrudelli.com and get on our email list for show notifications and for free content that is exclusively for subscribers. Also on anthonycrudelli.com, you will find tons of videos and education on trading futures, options, and crypto. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Opinions expressed are solely my own and my guests, and they do not express the views or opinions of my sponsors. Futures Radio Show is produced by Crudelli Productions.